and go ahead and, and get ourselves started. And so I will give a, a little little introduction to our speaker. Um, uh, I'm Elaine France. I'm um, chair of the Justice Reform Committee of Moore, uh, which I always like. <laughs> Mount Lebanon organized for racial equality. And uh, I'm also uh, a member of Shua South Hills United Against Hate. Justice Committee, and um, we were talking about um, both organizations about the need to kind of figure out what to do next because both of us really started quick over the summer, you know, and tried to figure out what we were doing. Uh, both uh, organizations very interested in sort of racial justice and police reform, and um, and we you know we did our rallies and all that, and then we thought, well, what you know, how do we turn this into a long-standing uh, commitment? You know that's more structured and um, and more uh, you know effective, and and so I started to think who who did I know who's been a really effective worker in uh, community organization, and the one person that definitely stood out far more than anybody else was uh, Heather, uh, my friend um, Heather Arne, who has uh, been the had she actually started her own advocacy organization was it in two thousand and four. Like a long time ago. Uh, yes and no, because I am not the founder of the Women and Girls Foundation. Oh, I'm I totally wrong there. As oh. her CEO, but uh, it was founded by a, a number of really great, amazing people like okay. Cecilia Springer and Pat Ulbrich and Kathy Raphael and Hilda Pinkfu and women who are much smarter and awesomer than I am. But they Much awesomer women brought Heather in to lead the, um, the we're smart enough to know that Heather should be the first CEO <laughs> of the, the Women's and Girls Foundation. She's been leading that for a long time and, and they do a lot of uh, advocacy, legislative work and they train, she trains young women uh, to do uh, state level advocacy work. And she also just incidentally, um, she's on the, you're still right on the board at the Ms. Foundation. Is that right? Um, yeah, I was, I actually just rotated off after nine years. I was chair okay. there and um, yeah, now I'm, now I'm uh, actually enjoying a different kind of, uh, I'm co-chairing the Center for Feminist Art over at the Brooklyn Museum now. Excellent. She's done many other, she's run, she ran for state senator. Some people might, might remember that and, uh, Think about it ruefully every time you see Guy Reschenthaler. Oh, you know, it could have. Now Devlin. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, directed, she's a director, she directed a, a film, directed a play. She's done pretty much uh, everything. A mom, a good neighbor, um, a little bit of everything, but especially an excellent uh, 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 social activist. So um, I, happy to have her here to talk to us about how we can learn how to be more uh, effective in sort of long-term organizing. Thank you, that was, that was a big long introduction. First, I wanna, I wanna thank all of you. And hi, Stephanie, it's nice to see you in person. <laughs> um, uh, you know, when Elaine first asked me to, to join the group and talk a little bit tonight, I was like, this group already knows everything I could possibly say, because I've been, at least uh, kind of witnessing the work that you've been doing in the community uh, and, and really witnessing from the sidelines, that's what I'll say, because as a member of the local community, um, you know, when Elaine was talking about being on Zooms uh, at the lo really local level, um, you know, I feel like I've been um, less involved in the local work um, because I've been more involved in state and national work lately. And so, I'm really grateful for all of you that have been doing a lot of really important work locally. So first I wanna say, I see you and I'm grateful and you've been doing really important, uh, really important good work. And so truly when Elaine first, we took a little walk around the neighborhood and she was like, hey, would you mind talking to the group? And I was like, I seriously don't know what I could possibly say to this group because every time Elaine tells me what you're doing or I hear about it in the community, um, I'm just like, yeah, they're doing all the right things. So um, so I want you to start with that so that afterwards you're not like, why did she even come? Because we already knew everything she told us. I'm gonna start with the preface saying, um, I really know already that you're doing a lot of really smart things because you're a lot of smart people. 
um, who care deeply and who are already thinking systemically. Um, so I just want to start with that preface. Um, as Elaine said, um, you know, some of you, it's, some of some of you don't know me at all. Some of you know me in different ways, um, either as a neighbor or as someone who once ran for office or as someone who um, maybe one of your teenagers has done um, Girl Gov or maybe you've just you know heard of the Women and Girls Foundation. So let me just do a very quick. Um, you know, overview of just, you know, what the Women and Girls Foundation is, is we are an organization, like Elaine said, that engages in public advocacy. And like yourselves, we really do it uh, at the systemic level. So we look at um, where inequities lie. We're particularly looking at gender inequity, but with an intersectional lens. So we're looking at gender inequity, racial justice issues, issues around reproductive justice, issues around wage inequity. Um, so it's, uh, you know, really because things, we try to look at things in an intersectional way, it's, it, you know, things are never just gender, right? So, um, um, uh, so, but what we try and do really is look at systemic causes and then try to think about, well, why is this happening? How could we uh, work to make sure this doesn't happen again? How do we try to improve this at some sort of systemic level? Um, and then as all of you know too well, that means it's not easy work, it's not simple work, it's uh, these, <laughs> these issues around systemic racial injustice, uh, systemic racism, systemic um, uh, sexism, uh, systemic economic inequities built into a capitalist system are <laughs> built into our system uh, for generations and, and they can't be undone quickly. Uh, so, uh, so it's long-term work. Uh, and this is the same thing we talk to our teenagers and girl gov about. Um, so, um, so I'm I'm really grateful for for all of the work that you're doing, especially around issues like police reform, uh, criminal justice reform, uh, and thinking about how to engage in that work at uh, both a neighborhood level and a community level, and then taking that up to the to city and state level. And I think what Elaine wanted me to mainly kind of talk with you all about tonight uh, is how do we think about advocacy uh, uh, when we're, we're considering um, systemic issues from the local level and then uh, when do we need, when do we want to think about engaging at like the state level or the federal level and how do we go about doing that and um, uh, because some of the things that you're trying to tackle, uh, some of them absolutely um, need to be tackled at the very local level because of the way the laws are written, right, around local uh, um, ju jurisdiction. And then some other things you can't get at at the local level because of how state law or federal law is written. So um, so that's that's a little about what we're going to do today. And, and mainly kind of uh, in some ways it just feel, could feel like very fundamental because because at the at the basics of it uh you know some of it is just reminding ourselves of those like very initial steps um and and also you know i'm going to kind of go through this but i want I, I hope this will be a dialogue too and kind of just i don't know how you normally do this with guests but you know kind of jump in and i know this can be sort of harder to do on zoom but you might, I think we're all pretty assertive people. <laughs> I think actually, do people just want to, do we just give everybody permission? And then if somebody's like taking advantage of that and, and cutting in too much, I'll tell you to stop. But that probably, <laughs> yeah. but just, just, it just, just jump in if you want to do that. If that yeah. is that okay with you, Heather? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, so Elaine and I talked a little bit before tonight about, about sort of like what might be most helpful. And so, you know, when we when we at WGF think about um, uh, so think about an issue we might be working on, you know, one of the first things we do, and and you all have already, you know, you're already kind of like beyond these stages, right? Is thinking about, you know, what is the issue you're trying to tackle, um, and and kind of doing that whole systems tree, right? Of kind of like taking that complex problem and like root root causing it up, right? Um, and you've all been doing, I would say, a lot of that work already. So tonight I wasn't gonna really kind of take us through that process because I think you've already been doing that. Um, 
uh, you know, and so, so that is an important process and you've all already been doing that, right? Because you know, like often we'll talk to our teenagers about, you can talk about an issue at a very broad level, right? Like racial inequity for, um, or just like inequity period for black girls in our public school system, right? Like that's a really big problem, but you can't take on that problem at that macro level, right? Like it's, it's not that even that it's too large, it's just that it's non-definable, right? So you need to be able to look at, okay, well, why is it that um, both, both service delivery and then therefore outcomes are completely inequitable? For black girls in our public girls public school system, like where is the, where is the breakdown happening? And so then you know through then research right and looking at analysis, you can start to like look into oh, okay, well what's the situation happening around um, discipline around cops and schools around right like so so starting to to look into all these different systems. And then a, a one group of people might say, okay, well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna really tackle this cops and schools situation. And someone else might say, okay, what we're gonna tackle is um, Title IX issues. Because what we're finding is like, if we can just get more athletic support and equal athletic support for girls in schools, then actually academic outcomes are better for girls we see lower pregnancy rates and we actually see like higher rates of college applications, college, college recruitment, et cetera. So like even within, even within um, advocacy groups looking at the same data, you can end up with different advocacy strategies um, once you start to look at, you know, like what's happening. And that's what you've all been doing, I think, you know, really looking at like what's going on with the policing. <laughs> in our community. Um, so, um, so when looking at opportunities around the state or even just thinking about like what's local and what's state, um, as you've been looking at, you know, like issues around transparency, but then more that, right? Like if, um, if we want to sort of decolonize this place, but like basically, you know, as, as you're looking to find ways to restructure how policing is done in our community. Um, some of that uh, you are impressively finding a lot of ways to do at the very local level, but you might find that there are some things that feel like they are state or federal impediments. So, you know, the first right next level is to sort of research the existing state and federal kind of legislation or jurisdiction or language or law. And you, you all know that. Um, but then the next step is sort of thinking about like, what would you want to change, <laughs> right? Um, and then what we always advise is thinking about like, okay, what else is out there um, that's similar? So thinking about, you know, what look, so now is a really interesting time because we're in a calendar, just so just in the year, like here we are, it's November, the state legislature session is about to end. Um, and it's a two, they, our state assembly works in two year, it's a two year session. So you can look at all the bills that have been submitted um, on these topics and, and it would be, you can, you can go onto the Pennsylvania legislative um, state assembly website. You can do keyword searches. You can do all sorts of things. You can look by committee. Um, but it's a good time to do it because you can look back at this whole two year time frame of all these pieces of legislation in order to see what pieces have been introduced related to your topic. And that's important because you might find that there are legislators who have introduced legislation that might be somewhat like what you are interested in. It might not be exactly the same, but it's worth doing because if you can find that let's say, Representative Summer Lee has introduced a bill that has some of what you're talking about, right? That Representative Ganey has introduced a bill that has some of what you're talking about, um, or that has the core values of what you're talking about, but doesn't have the, that isn't actually talking about the kind of a specific thing you are, but you can tell, oh, the person that introduced this bill, they'd be on board with my bill, right? Um, that's the kind of stuff you're looking for. Sometimes you find, oh my God, like, you know, Jake Wheatley introduced 
almost the exact thing, thing I would I would introduce, right? So you want to do you want to try to do all that research because you want to see if you can find has anybody introduced legislation that's even close to what you would want? Where are your potential uh, champions, uh, allies? And, and also the opposite, right? <laughs> like, you know, because you, you're gonna also see the other kind of bills, right? Like who introduced bills that are the strengthening the, the law and order kind of bills, the, the bills that would sort of take away civil rights from folks engaging with police, right? So, so, so just by looking at what legislation has been introduced by what, um, by how people have voted within a committee you can get a sense of who are the um, potential legislative allies and potential legislative um, uh, opposition to the, to the issue you're on. And, and I know you might think, oh, but I could just know that already. It's gonna be these Ds and these Rs, but it's not always so straightforward. Um, and also remember like we're here in Pittsburgh, but there's a big state, oh, right? Um, big, big state and um, and especially when it comes to these issues, like a lot of our allies are gonna be out in Philly and you might not know who they are. You might not know them as well as you know Summerlee, you know? So, um, so looking at that, that legislation now is a really good time because this session is about to end. And when it does, all those bills die. Sad bill death. I have, I have one of those bills that's about to die. So it's very sad. Um, uh, and so what will happen is everything will have to be reintroduced if it's going to be reintroduced, everything starts again. So it's a really good opportunity, let's say, um, and you all probably know this, but, but so let's say, and this is, this is true, you know, that there, is a, there, are, there are a bunch of legislators and there's a package of legislation that relates to um, the police, to criminal justice reform, to police reform, right? Um, um, you know, and that package was introduced by some, by Representative Lee, by Representative Ganey, by Representative Wheatley. Um, it's a, it could be a really, if there are things you'd like to see happen at the state level, one, of course, look at the legislation they introduced in case it's already in there. But if it isn't, it's a great time to be able to go and meet with those legislators before they reintroduce their package to be able to talk to them about how could what you want be incorporated into that legislation before they reintroduce it. Um, because they're gonna wanna reintroduce that legislation. Right. Um, and, and so that's that's the kind of thing that that this is now like these are good months to be doing those things. Um, yep. Sorry. Were they expecting that kind of like? Can you just like from their perspective, like would it feel? I, I think I know the answer is no. But like, it, would it feel weird for them if you're like, oh, I'm this interested citizen. I've never met you before, but I have this idea about something you put in a bill. Is that something they're dealing with every day, or is that you know? Like, is that just the normal process or like how, 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 how much would they be expecting that kind of thing? That's a, it's a great question. Um, so, you know, most folks don't pay attention to what's being introduced up to what's in sort of in play. Um, I think, uh, so first, it's just a great question. I think what would be, what's helpful, what's always helpful is if you're meeting with a legislator is to meet with them with someone from their district, right? So a lot of the legislators I just mentioned don't represent Mount Lebanon, right? So, I, and it's very possible, and I think it's true that Dan Miller is a co-sponsor on that legislation, um, but he's not the initiator or lead on that, those pieces of legislation. Um, so if you're going to meet with those legislators, um, it would be great for your coalition. It's a good idea anyway, which kind of leads to like one of my next steps, which is about like broadening your coalition, right? Um, and maybe you already have members that are in other districts. Um, uh, but, the, but 
you know, one of the, th so one of the things we do, so, so Women and Girls Foundation, the state bill and the state policy that, that, that we are involved in that we're leading right now is the, uh, the Family Care Coalition, the Family Care Act. The Family Care Act is a bill that would establish a paid family, excuse me, paid family and medical leave for all workers in Pennsylvania. Um, and so to what we've been doing right for over these last six years is building a statewide coalition. So that when we are meeting with legislators in state, the state assembly, uh, we are ensuring that we have people from their, their district meeting with them, right? Um, so your question's a really good one, Elaine, because um, you know, if you're meeting with Summer, if you're meeting with Ed, if you're meeting with Jake, it, they'll always, those are, those are great people. They'll always take your meeting, um, but it will mean more to them. It means more to any legislator if you meet with them from someone from their own community. Uh, so I would definitely encourage you to try, try to do that first <laughs> and then, you know, have that meeting. Um, yes, Don, Don, uh, Pete. Pete. Uh, thanks. You're so. not <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. I, I'd be com I'd be comfortable with that. Um, so, how much does the calculus change? Because three or four weeks ago, we were on calls with uh, Dan Miller and Jordan Harris, and there was this radical hope that there might be a flip in the legislature. Mm -hmm. And tragically, I think actually the numbers are going to be worse, um, not better, not even flip, but not better. So, what even now, I think, I think the specific bill you were speaking about, a paid family leave, to me has far better chance about having bipartisan support than yeah. some of the issues about police reform. Not all. Mm -hmm. um, so at what point do you change the calculus to say, I think it was Jordan Harris who had said, sometimes our best bills are stopping bad bills, something like that. It was something he said that, right. you know, we don't get credit enough for stopping more bad stuff in acting. And so we didn't get our dream, but right. we stopped a lot of worse things. Are you and, and your group looking at a recalibration about what you would have hoped for a month ago? Um, so, so you're right on two fronts. So um, you're right about the Family Care Act because our lead sponsors are Republicans. So, um, so we have for years, been working with a legislature that is Republican controlled. Uh, so while it would have been potentially nice if that changed, that's been our situation for many years, right? So because we've been working on this issue for several years, um, uh, we have worked, uh, and remember the, this session is, you know, the two year session that's ending, right? So when we work to get this bill introduced, our strategy was to have it be bipartisan um, but with the lead sponsors being Republicans, uh, with sub sponsors being Democrats. So in the in the Senate, our lead sponsor is Senate Senator Dan Laughlin in Erie, who's a Republican, and then his his co sponsor is Senator Marie Paulette, who's a Democrat out in Bucks County. And in the House, the Senate lead uh, the House lead uh, sponsor is Representative Wendy Thomas, a Republican out in Montgomery County. And then the Democratic co-sponsor is our own Dan Miller. Um, but that of course meant that, you know, Marie Collette and Dan Miller would have sponsored that bill six, you know, on day one, you know, Jake Wheatley would have sponsored that bill. Ed Ganey would have sponsored that bill, you know, like Dan Franco would have sponsored that bill. But we had to ask all of our liberal friends to wait in the wings because you're, because to your point, if they were the lead sponsors, that bill would sit and move nowhere, um, which is tragic, but the truth. And we needed to find Republicans who could get on board uh, so that it could be bipartisan, so that it could get introduced in committee and get a committee hearing and get Republican co-sponsorship and be, a bi be bipartisan and move forward. Because to your point, the issue is a bipartisan issue, right? It pulls well on all sides, right? Um, so for our, for our, so to answer sort of part of your question, for our organization, we aren't changing our strategy on that issue because we've been bipartisan on that issue for many years. Um, uh, if the Democrats had won, we would we would be changing our strategy, 
we'd be fine with that too. <laughs> um, you know, and, and that would have been okay because we have a lot of supporters on both, you know, on, on that side too. Um, and, but, uh, but that's not the case, right? And so we're, we're looking at a more Republican majority. Um, as we all know, on, on more uh, sort of issues that are more important um, to those of us on sort of the liberals, I, I, you know, I don't like to call these partisan issues. I think this is about sort of being human um, and where you are maybe around government. Um, and so, you know, for those of us who are in favor of criminal justice reform and less policing in our communities, um, those issues are less supported by the Republican Party right now. Um, and so you're right, that's going to be harder um, to try to find those uh, Republican supporters, right? Of um, and, and that you're right, that probably part of it will be for your group to be looking for both what are the bills you're going to need? Try to be mindful. Try to look out for that you'll you'll want to try to stop. But then, um, what are the opportunities around um, around um, uh, around legislation? You know, one interesting thing, and this is so bizarre, but like this is the one one of the things I've learned from all these years um, uh, being an advocate is that. Um, sort of the strange bedfellows thing. Like sometimes you end up on the right, on the same side for completely different reasons. So um, I, uh, I really do think that there are going to be some Republicans that are interested in um, decreasing support for local police departments because they're interested from a libertarian perspective around decreasing government and making government smaller and decreasing um, government investment. Uh, now, that's a really different reason than why you or I might be interested in making police departments uh, involvement in our everyday lives smaller. Um, but you might find uh, some Pennsylvania legislator uh, from, you know, Lancaster uh, who might be coming from that perspective. Um, and, and that might be your person. There are some surprises to be found. Um, and then sometimes there, there are people who stand in your way who would never ever uh, guess, you know, and that's, that ends up being, um, you know, surprised too. So, you know, we, we, I think part of what I've learned is not to necessarily assume who your, your allies are or your, your opposition is gonna be. It's like when you found these people uh, who are end up being your Republican sponsors, um, did you find them like through social networks or did you find them through like, you know, I mean, you've been at it for a while, so you probably have a more sophisticated way of finding them or did you find them because of you looked at the bills they'd sponsored and you kind of did your research that way? Um, no, those are good questions. So we found them through a couple of intersections, it's like intersectional research. So part of what we were looking for was, um, people, uh, so we were looking for Republicans who were in uh, moderate districts, right? Whose districts seemed like they were sort of flip districts in Pennsylvania, right? Uh, which meant that their constituents would be in support of this issue. And they themselves for political reasons might need to be in support of this kind of issue, especially in an election year. So both Laughlin and Thomas were up for elect re-election this year. They had strong Democratic competitors. Um, they are in um, seats that really could have gone to Democratic um, competition. Uh, and this is and paid family and medical leave is an issue that quote unquote like suburban women and and others care deeply about. Uh, so that was part of our factoring in. We were looking for people who had a personal issue. Uh, in connection to this issue. Um, so uh, Dan Laughlin, it ends up actually took care of his father um, uh, when his father was ailing and then going into hospice. Um, Senator Marie Collette um, has a father who was living with her until um, he just recently passed away. So, um, you know, that, that kind of thing um, makes a big difference uh, because then the person who you pick is going to have a personal commitment to the issue. 
Um, and so we kind of look for lots of different things when we're looking for a sponsor. Yeah. Heather, I'll just jump in another. Do you ever make a decision to go narrow then, to just find a smaller element to go for instead of the dream you want? Did, tactically, how do you approach that? Yeah, um, you know, a few years ago, we worked on, um, <laughs> we worked on a bill that in the end ended up being an amendment to somebody else's bill. You know, like sometimes you have to be flexible and kind of give up, you know, what you thought you were, you know, <laughs> like, you know, we were going, you know, for, for this and, you know, are you, you turn to, the camera off? You sort of, you know, in our minds, we're going to get this bill passed, but then, uh, you know, in the end it was, are we going to get this bill passed? Or if we, if we put, um, put this part of it as an amendment onto this other thing, then it's going to have a greater chance of getting passed. And, that, and that's what happened. Um, and we did have to give up part of, of what we had wanted, um, you know, which happens. Um, and that was, we were working with uh, one of our teenagers from GirlGov, Sarah Pessy, had written a bill uh, to, uh, which was an anti-stalker bill. And she had written this bill when she was 13. Um, and it was because she herself had been a victim of stalking. And, um, and it's like, we're all, well, maybe not we're all parents, but like parent or you know, a parent, but like, this is like this story. She was being, she was being stalked by a soccer coach who was not even her coach, but was a co coach of another team. Um, and who kept showing up like she, Sarah was such a great soccer player that she ended up coaching like the littler kids teams, uh, not coaching them, like being a ref at the littler, the littler kid teams, uh, kid plays. And he would show up and then, you know, he'd approach her like in the bathrooms and stuff and it got very creepy and very bad. And so she and her parents went to the local police and they said there was nothing they could do about it. Um, because the way that the state stalking laws were written um, and protect the way that the state protection from abuse orders were written, um, you could only get a PFA uh, against someone who is related to you or in an intimate relationship with you, but you couldn't get a PFA from a stranger. So if he hurt Sarah, then her parents should come back and then the police could do something. But until he actually assaulted her, there was nothing they could do. And I say, started this as a parent, cause like, can you imagine going to the police, trying to get help and them saying like, there's nothing we can do, but if this guy actually assaults your daughter, come back and then maybe we can help you. So, and so she was like 12 when, when this all started, she was 13 when she wrote the bill. bill. So what she did was she researched why that was. And she found that it, that, that Pennsylvania was one of the few states where we had that language and that there were 30 other states that had PFA language that included stranger stalking. And so Sarah wrote a bill based on the other bills and she went to her state representative and she had him and asked him if he'd introduce the bill and he did. So she did all the like good things and she was in youth and government class. She did this youth and government program when, when this happened and so, sort of it describes the sort of difference between youth and government and girl gov. So youth and government, really cool. They asked you to write a mock bill. She did it. She did it about this huge thing. And then she went to her state representative and asked him to introduce the bill and he did. Um, we met her a year or so later um, and she told us the story when she was in girl gov and all of us were like, oh my God. And the bill hadn't moved. And it's because as you all have commented on, the bill was introduced by her democratic representative in this Republican controlled legislature. And he wasn't on, not only was he in the minority, but he also wasn't on the committee that would have to discuss that bill. Um, so, uh, so we ended up take it, working with Sarah and over the next year, the goal was to get a Republican on the judicial committee 
which is the committee that would have to vote that bill out of committee to get it to the House floor, to get a Republican on that committee to be the lead sponsor on the bill. Um, and so, um, so that's what, what happened. We got Brian Ellis, to, Brian Ellis to be the sponsor of that bill. Um, and, and so to, to sort of Pete's question, like all along, there was this big goal of Sarah's bill, right? Passing Sarah's bill, which was gonna be this changing the PFA laws, having this anti, this stalker stranger law. Um, <laughs> this one bill sort of teaches you all sorts of stories. We end up, um, the bill ended up being fought against, meaning like there was sort of lobbying against this bill um, by two groups. Um, the uh, sort of like ACLU and, and, and labor organizations, which Women and Girls Foundation is normally in very, very close alignment with. Um, and then the Pennsylvania uh, Domestic Violence Organization Association. So never in a million years would have seen that coming, right? And the reason was um, the unions felt that corporations and management could use this new language to say that strikers striking outside Walmart would use, so they felt like the Walmarts of the world would use this new language to say that people on, who were striking outside a large retailer were harassing Walmart customers and therefore they try and arrest the striking workers. So they didn't want it. <laughs> Pennsylvania Coalition for Domestic Violence didn't want it because they were the original authors of the original language of the original PFA for Pennsylvania. And they wrote it in a specific way for specific reasons and they didn't want the language changed. And so we found ourselves with like the strangest antagonists on that bill, right? Um, and, and in the end, we had to come to agreement with the Pennsylvania Coalition for Domestic Violence um, to make Sarah's bill an addendum on a different bill that they wanted passed, which actually involved appropriations for domestic violence shelters, to be frank. Um, and would then give protections for minors who are being, being stalked by strangers. Not everybody. So I still can't get one, Elaine still can't get one, but, but, but minors could. And that was the compromise that had to be made. Um, but so these are the <laughs> true tales, true tales of Harrisburg lobbying, perhaps more than you wanted uh, to know on that one, but. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. Um, does anyone else? I have a couple of ideas or questions, but I don't want to dominate if people have like questions about. Um, I just wanted to go back to the research piece. I know that's kind of what we it start, it started talking about at first. And um, you had mentioned, Heather, about, you know, researching the bills. And that was one of the things that we we identified uh, early on as being a missing piece and more as having a a researcher. Mm -hmm. And we started a relationship with Dan Miller's secretary to update us on uh, bills that are being uh, introduced, passed in Harrisburg. Um, but in our research, we find that we found that it takes a lot of work. There's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of work, a lot of research. And so um, we is it do you do you think it's better to it's best to find um the aids for each of our rep each of the representatives that we we identify as allies and develop a relationship with them until we find someone that could be more of a permanent position here and more um, that's a, yeah that's a great question stephanie there are a couple ways to go about it one way as you've already gone about is like to try to um, ask for assistance through the staff, which is a great, a great way to do it. So that's like step one, absolutely. Another way is there are staff who actually work for the committees um, in Harrisburg. So each of the committees have a staff person. Now those staff people work for legislators, but so for example, um, so for the Senate Labor and Industry Committee, right? I know that one well, because that's the one that the Family Care Act is in. Um, that's not gonna be your committee, but I'm just gonna use that as an example. 
Senator Bar so um, so there's there's an executive director of that committee. His name's Eric. He actually works for Senator Bartolotta, who's the who is the committee chair of the Labor and Industry Committee. So Eric works in her Harrisburg office, but Eric is officially the executive director of the Senate Labor and Industry Committee. So it's kind of his job to be to be. So it is his job to um, to be following the legislation and organizing the legislation that's in front of that committee. So at any time I can contact Eric to find out what's in front of that committee. I could send him an email and ask him to send me a record of what's like, you know, what's in front of that committee, what's in front of that committee for the last two years. I mean, that's his job. So um, so you, you, I think it'd be great for you all to think about like, what are the committees that, um, that intersect with your issue? And, and that is something you could ask the staff at Dan Miller's office, right? Because that, like, that's something they could help you figure out if it's not obvious. And then, um, and then, um, uh, and actually, and Pamela Iavino still got a couple of months, so I'd I go and ask. I'd ask someone at Pam's staff, right? Pam's office. Same thing for the Senate. Um, and then you could contact the executive directors for those committees. Um, and ask them to, to give you that information. So you could say, oh, I'm looking for legislation that was introduced in this, in this past session that had to do with these issues. Um, can you help me find them? Um, the other thing to do, so staff of those committees can be a great resource for you so you don't have to do all that digging yourself. Um, the other thing would be um, finding, and, and you again, like, you know, I'm sorry if you've already thought of these things, um, advocacy organizations that work on your issue, whether they're at the local level or state or national are probably already tracking these things. So for example, for Women and Girls Foundation, Family Values at Work, the National Partnership for Women, they are tracking these bills that we're tracking, right? So at any given time, um, you know, before we got involved with issues of paid sick days or paid family leave, National Partnership for Women, Family Values at Work, you know, for us, that's who we would go to and say, do you know, um, you know, have you seen legislation that's been introduced around this? Not just here, but I can contact National Partnership for Women and Families and say, do you know if there have been any paid, can you send, you know, do you know what paid sick days bills have been introduced in other states that we might want to look, look at, right? And then they can point me towards those. And that's really, you know, helpful because the way that the Family Care Act and the Family Care Campaign even works here in the state, how our, our campaign and coalition works is that we're connected to Family Values at Work, which is the national coalition of all the state leaders moving state bills across the country. And our state legislation is modeled after all those other state bills. So we aren't reinventing the wheel, right? So our bill is modeled on Massachusetts bill, is modeled on Connecticut's bill, is modeled on New York's bill, right? And we all trade information, um, like we're on calls weekly with one another. So, um, so I have to believe that there are um, organizations that are, that are interested in this issue that are working in Pennsylvania and or at the national level that could be great resources to you. And then you have to do it all on your own. Yeah. That was enormously, uh, enormously helpful. Um, that just uh, that that particular blurb there, I think I took like 20 notes. You know? so, <laughs> thank you. Because that's just kind of like on the ground, you know, like it's like the, the details, the practical, the nuts and bolts, you know, I call it of like, you know, to you, it seems really obvious, but it's like, oh, there's an executive director of a committee, you know, um, <laughs> or there's a national, it actually never occurred to me to reach out to like other organizations doing the same thing, <laughs> asking them what I, they do. I think like, sometimes we just think like, oh, but we have to do, it's like, you know, like, I don't know, we're not Protestants, but like some sort of Protestant work ethic or something. I don't know, like we have to do it ourselves, but we don't, you know, like the whole, you know, like, the, like you know, it, it's helpful actually, right, to connect with others who might be doing this work. Um, yeah. Yeah, and what about like relationship building and relationship maintenance with public officials? Like, do you guys have strategies for doing that? And then also, at some point, if you could talk a little bit about fundraising. Um, 
Yeah. Sure. Um, relationship stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, I would definitely say in some ways broadening the coalition is important around both pieces. So, um, you know, there's, uh, so in, in lots of different ways. So one is, um, you know, we've already talked about the shifting, um, uh, the electoral, uh, results. <laughs> Um, you know, even here in our very local level, that means there's change, change is about to happen. Um, so, you know, if you can, so diversifying your coalition around like, you know, you know, and I'm not, again, like, I'm, I don't want to assume anything, but like, you know, it's good to have bipartisan membership, right? Like, especially knowing like, even here in this local district, we're soon going to have like, a Republican state senator, right? So it's not enough just to have good relationships with Dan Miller in the Democratic caucus, because even at the very local level, right, here's your Republican state senator. So who in the coalition, right, to ha have like Democratic members, Republican members, people who can have good relationships with both sides, right? Both sides, but like, you know, all sides. Um, and then broadening to all these different um, regional areas, right? So also then like Pittsburgh members and then beyond and beyond. And when you look at the committee, so one of the things we do, right, is we look at the committees that are gonna be important to our legislation. And then you wanna build constituency for your coalition in all those districts, right? So then, um, so then you're, you're sort of strategically building coalition members in those districts of the legislators that sit on the committee um, that's good that you need. And then um, helping folks learn about your issue, um, develop their own stories, and then be able to go to those, those legislators and engage in legislative advocacy and tell their story about why this issue is important to them as a constituent of that legislator in order to try to advocate for that legislator's vote on that committee, right? Because in some ways, um, like when we talk about the Family Care Act here in Pittsburgh, people are always like, do you want me to talk to Ed Ganey? I will talk to Ed Ganey. And I'm like, that would be awesome, but that's okay. They're like, yeah, I love Ed Ganey and he's my BFF, but he doesn't help me on this bill. Like, you know, someday if we ever get it to the house floor, it'll be great that Ed can vote for it. But like in the meantime, like he's not on labor and industry and he's not a Republican. And like, it's, it's just, that's, that's not the strategic challenge right now. And so um, it's important to have those, you know, like it's, it's like you want to have like great legislative relationships and strategic legislative relationships, right, that, that relate to, to um, the committee that you're going to need to be communicating with and also the leadership of the chambers. And so um, actually, I, I know it recently changed and I'm finding out in like a, a not been paying attention. So I don't know the results. Um, maybe you all do, but like just literally like this past week, the chambers were voting on their new leadership for the next session. Um, but so, you know, we actually have had like Senator Costa has been in leadership on the Democratic side for the Senate. You know, we've had some uh, Representative Germany was in leadership uh, in the house for the Democrats. Um, so that was nice for our region because we had some folks here, um, but that might be changing. Uh, Representative Germany just lost his seat. So, you know, learning who's in leadership because that's important around, um, they control what bills are, are in play, what bills get to be considered, what bills get to be, um, be discussed and um, our priority for their party. Um, so that, that's important too. Yeah. And do you try to like touch base with them ever so often or like once you form, do you like send thank you cards and like, I mean, like what, you know what I mean? Like, do you, do you make it a point to, uh, to stay in touch? We do, um, we do a good amount of educate from the, from the family care campaign. We do a good amount of like education. It's hard to know what they actually ever see. Right. Um, but we do, um, send kind of like electronic one pagers 
related to um, the issue of paid family and medical leave and we send it, there's an electronic system where you can send information to all the members offices. So we do use that and send them like a one pager about every quarter. Um, but it's always hard to tell what they what they read in that way. Um, but um, but constituent visits is usually, and then yeah, of course, like if you do a constituent visit, then yeah, you do the thank you note afterwards. Um, yeah, and if people sign on as co-sponsors onto our legislation, uh, you, then you'll see us do a big thank you. So the Family Care Act has a Facebook page, um, which I encourage you to, to follow. And then if you do, you'll see how like we'll do a, um, you know, lots of images around like, thank you, representative so-and-so for signing on as a sponsor to this legislation, or, you know, if any of them ever say anything in the press supportive of paid family or medical leave, you know, we'll say like, oh, thank you so much, Representative Corman for speaking on, you know, out in support of Pennsylvania families, you know, so we try to um, give them carrots. Um, and then we do have a uh, phone to action uh, cam, uh, Ability so like if you text somewhere I have the number but like if you text I think it's five two eight eight six if you text the word family to five two eight eight six then like you you join our camp you can then they'll say like do you want to join our campaign and then you know we can send you texts like you know the Family Care Act's going to be in the Senate Labor and Industry Committee this week you know click here to send an email to your legislator you know and so we so we will. Um, engage our advocates in communicating to legislators uh, about the about issues through that kind of um, online advocacy. Yeah. If no one else has a question, I actually do want to ask this one thing that Heather is, I know it's, a, it's a, one of the worst parts about running a social movement and nobody likes it and it's awful, but uh, Heather's, I think, very good at it, which is on fundraising, right? Fundraising, you know, how is it? Because we, we actually don't know, you know, we don't, we haven't done any, we don't have any funds, but we're starting to think about things that would require funds. And so how do you do that? Are you all a nonprofit or what's your tax status? We don't have any money or any bank account or any status. So that's the first thing we have to do is be a 501 c 3 right? Well, I think you have to figure out what you wanna be first. Uh -huh. like, what do you wanna be when you grow up? Um, Cause that'll make a difference. You don't have to be a 501c3. You might wanna be a 501c4 um, actually um, because a 501c4 can endorse candidates can um, right then you'd be more like a pack right um, uh, and um, can take those kinds of political positions. So Women and Girls Foundation is a five hundred one c three. So you'll notice like we're issue focused, right? But I'm, I'm never going to say we endorse blah blah blah, right? We don't endorse candidates. We don't give money to candidates. We don't engage in that, right? Um, we're about the Family Care Act, right? <laughs> we're not about representative so-and-so um, uh, because we're a nonprofit, but that also means we can, when it comes to fundraising, you know, I can talk to you, Elaine, about how important it is for Pennsylvania families to be able to have paid family and medical leave because only 14% of workers in this entire country have access to paid family leave. And that's why it's so important to fund this movement. And so if you could make a donation, that would be so helpful. And then your donation is tax deductible, right? So fundraising for nonprofits different. It's not that it's easier. It's just that if you make a donation to Women and Girls Foundation, it's tax deductible. And that's gonna mean something to some folks, although the Republicans have certainly made it mean much less to working people because none of us can itemize. And you know, so it kind of doesn't really mean anything to working people, but you know, it means something to like billionaires or something. But but still, from a tax code standpoint, it means if you make a donation to WGF, it's tax deductible. If I make a donation to um, a 501c4, it's not. If I make a donation to Pam Iovino's campaign, it's not, right? If I make a donation to the C4 part of Planned Parenthood, it's not. If I make a donation to Emily's List, it's not. Um, so, so that's important to, to decide when you all decide 
to do any fundraising. First, you'll have to decide what you are because I, I think in order to take donations, you need to, to somehow be a something. Um, I mean, you can, you could, you could go be go the nonprofit route through a fiscal conduit for a while, um, and and be that way, you know. So it's sort of like a mini nonprofit, and and that could like stall the decision, um, which is fine. Um, but just because of of your political interests, you you might just you know I I would just say don't necessarily assume you want to be a five one c three. Um, but so reg regarding fundraising, um, I would say that in general, C3 dollars are easier to raise than C4 dollars because of the tax deductible side and because you can get grant funding and those kinds of things that C4s can't access. Um, so, you know, for the Women and Girls Foundation, um, and thank you for saying that you think I'm good at fundraising, but you know, a lot of our programs, um, you know, we raise funds uh, through programming grants uh, because we have to. We could never run GirlGov based on what individual donors give us. Um, we we would never be able to keep the lights on, and I wish we could because it would be much more sustainable. Um, but but right now, um, you know, our programs. Uh, uh, absolutely rely on um, grants, right? On grant writing. Um, now, luckily, it's not like one or you know one foundation, right? Like we we have a pretty diverse kind of portfolio of foundations that we apply to uh, locally and nationally for both Girl Gov and um, the Family Care Campaign and Femisphere. Um, but individual donors are um, harder because they're just, especially for a grassroots organization like us or like you will be. You know, our average donors are, are fairly small donors, $25, $50, $100. You know, we're not the museum. I was on a call where someone said uh, like something about a $25 million gift they got. That's nice. That doesn't happen for us, but it sounded nice. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think fundraising I, I don't I don't think of you know I don't I don't ever dread it because I think of it as movement building you know like you know when I if I talk to you about the Women and Girls Foundation you know I'm not talking to you about like oh could you do me a favor you know it's not like could you loan me a buck you know like you know I, I mean anyone I'm talking to if I'm having a conversation with them um, about investing in the Women and Girls Foundation, then I hope I'm having a conversation with them about how they can invest their philanthropic dollars in something they care deeply about. Um, and whether that's about, you know, supporting girls and helping them develop their abilities to be future elected leaders and change makers today through investing in GirlGov, or whether that's helping us achieve paid family or medical leave, whatever it is, like, you know, that's kind of my feelings around fundraising. Thank you. Does anyone else have questions for Heather? I don't have a question so much as I wanted to add something to what you were talking about, about fundraising. And um, one thing that, you know, an organization like, like more needs to think about, I mean, in, in order to get all the the legal advice you need and also get the filing done to do a, become a nonprofit, you know, that, that takes money too. Um, and so if you look at like what kind of needs you have um, in terms of what you want to be, uh, be able to fund, maybe, you know, you could set up something like, um, you know, a small dues for all the members or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, there are a number of organizations that, that do that. And, um, and the other thing is that, you know, um, I, I think Heather mentioned it, but I, I might have missed it looking at my phone, <laughs> but that um, you could partner with another organization, a bigger organization like, um, you know, Pittsburgh United or, you know, mm -hmm. that already has um, all of that. And I, I don't know how like that works in terms of do they get a portion <laughs> of the money that you raise, but you could, you could use their, um, 
you know, their, their status, their tax status to, uh, to raise money, uh, you know, become sort of a, under their umbrella. So that's an, another way of, of doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions out there for Heather? Okay, excellent. Well, Heather, this has been really, I, I have found, I, I think I have about 12 notes here that have been like super, super helpful to me. Um, do you want, Stephanie, do you want to say these? Do you want to announce what you just put in the uh, chat in case somebody doesn't have them mm. open? But you're, but you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, I was just um, putting in there before you guys leave, if you're interested in some more, uh, learning some more there, uh, the Pitt Office of Diversity and Inclusion is having a uh, What Happened Race and Soul Searching After Election 2020. Thursday uh, at noon, and I put the link in for registration. Also, someone sent me this, the Alliance for Police Accountability, talking about uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, partnerships. Um, they are doing a Facebook event on, also on Thursday at 7 p.m., uh, something, uh, well, in solitary confinement, uh, something doing with uh, Brianna's law. I guess there's a, a piece in there about ending solitary confinement in that law, so. Um, if you're on Facebook and you're so inclined, maybe you want to check that out. That's it. Yeah. And, and APA, the Alliance for Police Accountability, um, Poise Foundation is their fiscal conduit. So to Mikey's point, like if you if you want to make if you want to make a donation to APA, you can go to Poise Foundation and then you you go down to a specific fund that it's and you can find APA that way. And so um, so that's how. Um, Brandy's gone about, you know, their process. Um, so there's definitely ways of, I mean, you know, poise is one place that will, that has served that, that role for others. Thomas Merton Center um, often um, has played that role as well. Um, um, uh, there are a couple of others as, as too. So, you know, there, there are, you know, a number of different organizations in the community that will serve as a fiscal um, sponsor. When you say poise, how are you spelling that? P-O-I-S-E, Poise Foundation. Okay. Thank Excellent. You. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I found this really, really exciting and, uh, and helpful and just incredibly uh, practical, um, which is sometimes that you have to kind of step back from the exciting and step into the practical and, and before you can get back to the exciting again, I guess. <laughs> You know, but I think I think that that's exactly the kind of there, there's like there's so many things here that um, I think would be incredibly helpful in sort of building a, a structure for ourselves. So thank you. And I, is it okay if we hit you up for advice along the way? <laughs> yes, but really, thank you. You're all doing great work. And like I said at the beginning, like you, you, you already know all the good stuff, but I do hope, you know, something tonight, you know, was helpful and um, and Alliance for Police Accountability and Brandy Fisher is fantastic. So if you all haven't already connected with her, um, yeah, I definitely encourage you to do so. Um, she'd be a great um, ally and partner for all of you. And she worked very closely with um, Representative Lee um, and Ed Ganey and Jake Wheatley on that um, criminal uh, re police reform package of legislation that they introduced last year. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Some of which got through in altered form. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know they want to do a lot more. So, yeah. Yeah. excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much, and thanks everybody for coming out. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thank Spectacular, you. very wonderful. Great. Spectacular. Aww, thanks. Thank you. Night. Night, y'all. Night.